Hi, Terry. Can you hear me? Derek, can you hear me? Okay, can you check with the IT? Because it looks like Siva's in mains position. Not quite sure what's going on. Shall I start? Okay. I think we can start our afternoon session. So welcome back to everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm not quite sure who's connected now, but welcome back if you're rejoining the World the UPU World Leaders Forum this afternoon. Um, we have a, another packed program this afternoon. The first session will be on sustainability, and I have uh, two speakers standing by, David and Siva, who are going to speak to us. But, but first, we're going to have here a pre-recorded presentation from Anne-Marie Gardshaw. But just before we do that, can I remind you that you have the option to participate with questions and answers in the Q&A box uh, below. Thank you for all the questions and comments that we've received. We can't answer all the questions, specifically the, the very specific questions. We can't answer them all directly, but we will try and refer as many to get good answers as we can. And I will save some of them up for the final panel session when we will have a chance to discuss and debate some of the issues that have been raised during the day. Already this morning, we've had a lot of the important issues raised. And one of the issues that kept coming up was the issue of sustainability, which is the big issue of our time, as is in the headline for this part of the forum. And we can think of it in terms of climate change and the environmental impact, but also more broadly, as defined by the Sustainability Development Goals of the UN, and everything to do with looking after the planet's resources, pe people's health, nature, livelihoods, society's well-being, expressed in terms that affects us all. We heard from Fiji earlier on, and some of our friends in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, for them, climate warming is an existential threat. And in many cities, if you're coming from big urban areas, there's air pollution, deprivation. For many countries, social and economic inclusion are critical. For others, it's wildlife, forests, extreme weather, natural disasters. In one way or another, it affects us all. And as a sector, parcel, postal and logistics sector, we have a huge environmental footprint and we use a lot of energy resources and have some of the largest fleets of vehicles, but we also can have a huge impact on our suppliers, on our customers, our stakeholders. So collectively, as a sector, we can make a big difference. The question is, what difference will we make? What difference do we want to make? What difference can you make? Now, I'm on the older side of life. I still describe myself as being in my prime, but the real impact of what we do will be in our legacy to our children, I think, and our children's children. So it's a response, enormous responsibility on us to get this right. As I said, we'll be hearing in a minute from David from Ampost and from Siva from the UPU. But before, before that, I'm going to introduce Anne-Marie Gardshaw, who's the group CEO and president of PostNord, and she has been a member of the group executive team since 2012, and she's previously held positions of e-commerce, corporate clients, chief strategy officer, and executive positions at Gambro, and she was a management consultant at McKinsey. So Anne-Marie Godshall is going to tell us what they've been thinking about sustainability in Postnorm. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and I'm sorry I couldn't join you in real life, but I'd be very happy to talk about uh, the sustainability agenda of Post Nord. Our business strategy includes a very distinct sustainability agenda, and for us it means three things. First of all, we want to be a voice for fair conditions in the industry, but also a workplace where our employees can feel safe. Uh, and of course, we're striving towards a zero vision for fatalities and, and serious injuries as part of that. 
but also having an inclusive workplace characterized by trust and respect is very important. And of course, to make sure that we bring in diversity and inclusion. And we're also striving towards the gender balance of, of 4060. And finally, we would like to lead the industry into the low carbon economy. And we have taken a very scientific approach and a very ambitious approach over the past years uh, to reduce our climate impact. And we also have been making sure that our targets are aligned with the Paris Agreement, including scope one, two and three. And in 2020, we reached our target of reducing our carbon emissions by 40% compared to 2009. And this success has encouraged us to step up our efforts even further. So now we're aiming for a fossil free business operation by 2030. And this is what I will talk more about during my presentation. As I said, we have since long been very dedicated to reducing climate impact and our investments go into building a greener infrastructure our fleet, our terminals, but of course also making new, some new technology when that is available. And that is all key in achieving these ambitious targets. And the Nordics are also very privileged of having access to clean electricity, but also sustainably produced biofuels. And all that is part of our agenda. So how did we make the 40% happen? Well, the transition to emission-free vehicles is happening at scale but also transition is also now initiated for, for heavy trucks. So far, some 4,000 vehicles are electrically charged in our fleet, and that represents approximately a third. And then for the heavy transports, we're trying to use as much biofuels that we can get hold of, and that includes uh, biogas, uh, biodiesel, ethanol, and NRME. And we are using approximately 40 million liters of biofuels on a yearly basis. Uh, and the share of biofuels is constantly rising. And by the end of the second quarter this year, we were up to 31%. But we've also been pulling levers like modality shift and hypermiling. Uh, and that means that we have trained our chauffeurs in energy efficient driving, but also just you know, work on practical things like uh, wheel setting, anticipating traffic, but also looking at tire pressure and things like that. And of course, all the electricity we buy for our operations is green electricity from renewable sources. But we still have some 300,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions left in our operations. Uh, and this is where we now have worked heavily over the past six months, I would say, to put in place an agenda for getting rid of also that. And we call that our green technology roadmap. And in brief, what it means, it means that we're going to be fossil fuel free by 2030. By 2025, uh, we're going to reduce our carbon emissions by another 40%. So what we have done in 10 years, we're now going to do in five years. And finally, we want to go for a zero emission last mile, no later than 2027. So that's the agenda we're embarking upon. We don't know exactly how to get there, uh, but we are definitely determined to find a way uh, to reach our targets. And despite all these efforts, uh, we are going to have to do more. And that means we need to team up. We need to team up with all players in the value chain. And this is just one example uh, that I'd be very happy to share with you. So we have been joining forces with well-known companies like Scania, H&M, Ericsson, Siemens and E.ON in what we call the Pathway Coalition. And that is a coalition of very influential industry players that work together to achieve fossil free commercial heavy vehicles uh, or transports by no later than 2050. So innovation and cooperation uh, is key, not only finding future technologies, but also uh, by reducing the energy needed in our operations, because I would say the most sustainable energy is the one that we don't use. So I would like to point to one specific area where there's still a lot of untapped potential to reduce climate impact, but also to reduce cost. And we see the potential in the global logistic chain. We see it in our own operations. We see it inside our vehicles and we see it inside the parcels that we transport. And we have estimated that roughly some 30% of what we transport is air. So basically one third of our carbon emissions in our parcel transports is coming 
due to transporting air. And we all know that air can travel by itself. And by turning the spotlight to reducing air in e-commerce parcels, we wanted to address a very complex issue by asking ourselves a very simple question. What it, would it take for us in the e-commerce chain? Operators, companies, consumer, packaging technology companies and so forth to substantially reduce the air in e-commerce parcels. So by launching the initiative, the packaging journey, our approach has been to orchestrate a discussion among the entire logistics chain to try to find an answer to this very simple question. And our initiative got an instant and also very positive response uh, from the industry. And some of the challenges holding back uh, the industry development towards less air in e-commerce parcels were expressed in initial meetings and, and workshops. And you can see some of them listed here on the slide. It's things like investment in packaging technology not being feasible. Uh, the cost of storing multiple size parcel boxes is too expensive. It brings on some practical challenges like putting on the label on a small parcel is difficult. But it was also this whole notion of being afraid of jeopardizing the whole consumer experience when opening up the parcel. But we were lucky to have academia with us from an early stage. And uh, a two-year research funding program was granted to Sharmas University of Technology in, in Gothenburg to get the heart of this problem and, and to get the heart of finding a solution. And together with PostNord and the global well-known packaging DS Smith, we have now been on this journey for some time. And the key question we are trying to resolve is simply how can the optimized parcel help us find a solution for sustainable and efficient distribution of goods? Being half year into the research project, we have been struck by the complexity, but also by the potential. And our eyes has already been opened up to important achievements that we've been able to realize together with our customers. And one of our customers, uh, the Nordic Telecom uh, operator Telia, has set out the strategic target of zero emissions and zero waste by 2030. And one area of waste that was identified was the routers for TVs. Very often these can be easily repaired and re reused. Uh, but instead the user rather orders a new one. So this means transportation of a new router and it means more waste. So Telia was asking themselves the question, how can we engage the customer in our sustainability work by providing them with a simple user-friendly, but also sustainable return solution for the broken router? One that makes them feel good by simply doing good. So the packaging was optimized to fit different sizes of routers, but also optimized to create a positive unboxing experience. So the box can simply be used two times, by sending out the new router, but also by returning the broken one. And the result has been an average reduction of air of approximately 19% uh, by simply using three different sizes and with the smallest parcel reaching more than 50% reduction in air. On top of that, uh, the optimized packaging has also allowed them to reduce uh, packaging costs by another 15%. So less air, less carbon emissions, and of course, less waste. So I talked about how we have engaged our suppliers. I've talked about how, to, how we have engaged our, our customers. The next one that we turned to was the consumers. So how can we engage the consumers being part of this very important journey? And for credibility reasons, uh, we directed our interest uh, to the third party verified eco label called the Nordic Swan. And by joining forces with them and the whole e-commerce ecosystem in a series of multi-stakeholder workshops, uh, we wanted, wanted to find a common industry approach to consumer label for more sustainable transport services. So we were very delighted when the Nordic Swan recently announced that they will be going forward with developing criteria and have this in place by 2022. We are of course very proud to be part of this journey and of course be committed to continue to helping the Nordic Swan uh, to put this in place. And we believe that this will be the way of involving also the consumer in this important quest and for the whole transformation uh, of the entire industry. And by that, make sure that we actually make this happen for real.
So these are just some examples for how we will mobilize all the actors in the industry to reach our target of being fossil free by 2030. And by that, make sure that we lead the entire industry into the carbonized economy of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. And I think uh, you'll agree with me that that was a very insightful uh, approach to collaboration and coalition that Anne-Marie was talking about in terms of making things happen, different partnerships to do with uh, fossil free, the fossil free target and fuels for heavy goods vehicles, biofuels, working together with others to make it happen. A very interesting idea about the empty packaging that's we're all familiar with, how, how to right size packages and how to mi minimize, minimize waste. And then having the impact with suppliers, customers and consumers that you heard about at the end there. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, David McGredmond. He was appointed Chief Executive Officer of Ampost in October 2016. And he's been leading the company's transformation program returning to financial stability, revenue growth and profit by taking big steps to fix the company's econo economics and by restructuring the mails and parcels and retail business in line with the changing digital marketplace, what we've been talking about this morning. But also more than that, David is personally driving Ampos sustainability charter and he's positioned climate change, decent work, economic growth, sustainable cities and communities as really important elements of what he's driving at it with AMPOST. And so I, rather than try and tell you what he's going to talk about, I'll allow him to tell us what he's been doing. So David, can I hand over to you and tell us what you've been doing in sustainability? Thank you, David. Derek, thank you very much. And thank you to UPU and uh, hello to all of you who are on this webcast. I'm absolutely honored to be here um, in this really fine industry and an industry that I think has taken up the challenge, perhaps better than almost any other industry of sustainability. Um, we start with climate action and, and I thought Anne-Marie's presentation was extraordinary around what they're doing in Post Nord and uh, I'm really impressed by those targets and indeed I wish we could have, uh, while we've the same target, I wish we could have the same progress everywhere. Um, climate change is the bit that is the most pressing and obvious manifestation. But I hope in the next 10 or 15 minutes to show that actually it's not something that can be addressed just as a singular item. Because sustainability is, as Derek said at the start, it's built around a holistic approach. It's an approach that looks at the sustainable development goals as a way of interweaving society communities, business uh, together so that we can actually develop the right solutions. Um, we completely support the uh, target and it's going to be the target at, at COP26 as when it's uh, in Glasgow in November, that it will be officially then signed up to the 1.5 centigrade as the ceiling uh, target, uh, not the two centigrade that was there previously. Um, we completely buy into that. We also buy into the same target that um, Anne-Marie has actually set for Post Nord. We too have a target to be uh, zero, to have zero emissions by uh, 2030. We brought that forward uh, this year from a target to be there by 2050. We brought that forward to 2030. And by 2025, we expect to be 50% of the way there. And we've made substantial progress uh, so far. I mean, the, the COP26 goals, there's four goals they've set to secure global net zero uh, by mid-century. Well, I think we can get there sooner and I think Postal can get there sooner. To adapt to protect communities and natural habitats by restoring ecosystems. To mobilize finance, to uh, unleash the trillions required to secure global net zero, and then to work together uh, through collaboration between governments, businesses, and civil society. So 
I've said where we are and what, what it is we want to achieve. Let me just I'll take a few minutes to talk through what our sustainability strategy is, but I then want to broaden it to see something that I actually think is essential, an essential role for UPU and an essential role for Postal. You know, our strategy in UNPOST, our purpose is very clear. Our purpose is to act for the common good, to improve life now and for generations to come. We also have behind me here what is our, our more recent mark around sustainability, which, is, which says living leaves a mark. Together, let's leave one we're proud of. And it is about the generations to come that we are doing this for. And we build our sustainability around five of the uh, sustainable development goals. And, and from them, we develop really what is our, uh, what are our individual strategies. And our path to net zero, we're well established in that path and we will get there. Um, the remainder of carbon emissions we have, 53% are from the last mile fleet, 11% uh, is from, uh, or sorry, 31% is from the network fleet and 15% uh, is from property. You know, on the last mile fleet, we have made extraordinary progress. I'm proud that we are one of the top six postal organizations in the world in terms of percentage of electric vehicles in our fleet. And particularly proud that Dublin, our capital city in Ireland, has become the first postal city in the world to have uh, zero emissions from postal. And that's something that was recognized last year we are now extending that right now to every city in Ireland so that by the end of 2022, every city in Ireland will have net zero uh, carbon emissions from postal. Um, that's, that's the piece that in many ways is the easier piece because the technology is there and we know how to do it. The network fleet is a much more difficult piece because we've yet to get to really proven scalable uh, HGV or heavy goods vehicle uh, fleets, which are electric or which are using uh, hydrogen or other forms of um, sustainable energy. Um, but we expect to get there. In terms of property, uh, all our properties are engaged in serious emission reduction. We are rebuilding a lot of our properties. And, and that, that work is work that is just detailed work. It's embedded in our organization now. And it will happen. So the actions on climate uh, action are, 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 are in many ways going to be common to what are happening elsewhere in the world. Likewise, I mean, I think a really difficult one is responsible consumption and production. And I love what Amory is doing on, on, on reducing the air in, in, in packets and parcels. Um, for us around responsible consumption and production, we send zero waste to landfill. And we've developed a circular business model to design waste out of our systems. But what we're planning to do is really working on those areas of packaging that Anne-Marie has already discussed. On industry innovation and infrastructure, it's all about collaboration. I was very, that slide that Anne-Marie showed about companies working together is so essential. And we work in our project senator, which is partnering with Dublin uh, City Council, to make sure that we look after all the deliveries and we combine them for all uh, postal organizations or all delivery companies in Ireland uh, through one last mile uh, in Dublin. And that's, that's a project that we are doing uh, with others. On sustainable cities and communities, you know, COVID was quite extraordinary. What COVID, you know, the impact of the pandemic on people and society, was 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 so beyond anything we'd ever seen it's really interesting to see how postal stepped up and in ireland we stepped up in a very big way we made sure that our postmen and postwomen called in on the elderly we gave free postage to to old people's homes to to care homes uh, places where people couldn't visit we actually gave everybody in ireland free postcards so they could connect uh, with people who they couldn't see. And these, these are simple measures that Postal can do, but it comes from a culture in Postal that we act for the common good, that we're here for all citizens. It's a very human response. And our front lines, whether it be 
our postmen and postwomen or our post offices remained 99% open throughout uh, the pandemic. So that whole issue of sustainable cities, we also do through literacy programs, which are very important uh, in terms of adult literacy. Um, but we also do it through some very innovative measures such as address point, where we've given every homeless person the opportunity to have a home address, a proxy address, which they can then collect from their local post office. But it means they can apply for jobs. It means that they can apply for health care um, and, and not be distinguished as somebody who is homeless, but as somebody who has a home address. And that's been the sort of initiative that we think is absolutely essential to sustainable um, uh, communities. And then the final area is decent work. And this is the area I really want to, uh, to, to give a call to action around postal. You know, decent work is so important. I, I, I'm really proud. I've only been in this industry for five years and I'm so proud of what I see in postal. It's an amazing industry. It's an old industry. And it's an industry that has a extraordinary proud tradition of labor rights, of employee rights, of professional work, of proper training, of looking after people and those looking after our employees' families and making sure that they can lead decent uh, lives and sustainable uh, in sustainable communities. That to us is a cornerstone of what we do. So I would say that, that as an industry, I think we have a real obligation here to ensure that our governments tackle the socially destructive excesses of the gig economy. We have to stop the zero hour contracts. We have to stop the avoidance of labor law by a gig economy, typically by big tech combining gig economy uh, with technology. But that, that avoidance of labor law is something that is not just destructive to our industry, it's destructive to sustainability and is destructive to our planet. And um, we cannot have and cannot compete with companies who do not recognize employment and thirty save 25 to 30 percent in the cost that we all in postal pay to make sure that our employees have pensions to make sure our employees have access to decent health care. And indeed, as a society, the only reason that can exist, that gig economy, is because the state provides pensions also and health care. That is, that is stealing from the state and it is stealing from our industry and it's stealing from communities. So I make a very strong call to action on that. If we are investing in electric vehicles, training our drivers in eco-driving. They're professionals who are proud of their jobs. They're uniformed. They're trusted by people. How can they compete on price if you then have 10-year-old diesel vehicles with untrained drivers being paid uh, per parcel? Um, and it, there's just no comparison. So it's an extremely important part of sustainability uh, that we have that. Um, so, in on post, you know, we're very proud to be part of this industry. I'm proud of the UPU in, in developing um, uh, this, or in, in creating this forum around sustainability. Um, the right to a decent job with good terms and conditions is fundamental to a sustainable society, and we'll continue to fight for that. And I think I'll finish just, if I can, Dirk, with a quote from uh, on post sustainability report, which is available on our website. And I think it's something about bringing the humanity that postal uniquely, almost uniquely brings to industry. And it's this, and I, and I quote, for sustainability, read quality of life. Where you see carbon footprint, think a healthy island. And for climate action, believe in the joy of future generations. That's how we view sustainability in UNPUST. Being human is at the core of UNPUST, and our horizon is stationed in our purpose, to act for the common good now and for generations to come. And that's something I believe we share with great postal organizations around the world. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, stay there because we'll be coming back to have a question answer session with the panel after we've heard Siva. Uh, but thank you very much for making that point and emphasizing, reiterating the fact that the climate change is not the only issue. It's an important issue. It's a very big issue. But actually, sustainability as a as a topic is a much wider agenda that involves everything, as you said, decent work, uh, sustainable homes, sustainable cities, uh, and collaboration is the only way forward. It's no good for one operator, for even the posts individually, to be doing good things as they are in terms of meeting targets. We need to influence and involve everybody working in co co coalition and collaboration, as you said. So I think there's some important messages already you've brought out. So thank you for that. But I'd now like to hand over to uh, Siva Somasandram, who many of you will know in the UPU, who's the uh, director of, remind me, director of policy. Well, you can introduce yourself, Siva, please. <laughs> Uh, I, I just mislaid your title for the moment, but it's uh, it's about policy and regulation. But it means you have a strong interest, in, interest and responsibility for UPU's involvement in sustainability. That's the essential point, isn't it? So, Siva, can I hand over to you to present? And then after that, both Siva and David will join in a panel session where we we'll discuss what we've been talking about. So over to you, Siva. Thank you. Thanks very much, Derek. And uh, you did get my... Um title correct and, and, and my responsibilities correct as well. Um, I was just wondering whether the slides are available. Um, if IT support could have that up and ready. Great. Thanks very much for that. Um, so again, thanks very much, Derek, and it's a real pleasure to be here at the UPU World Leaders Forum, uh, both with yourself and, and David, and, and of course, uh, the many participants who've dialed in for this uh, very important event. Um, cert it is certainly the case that sustainability is a defining issue of our times. Uh, and it is an opportune moment to talk about sustainability, uh, given that COP26 is around the corner. And many of you would also be aware that uh, today in Yunnan, China, the negotiations for a new post-2020 global uh, biodiversity framework uh, aimed at a healthy planet has been uh, launched under the auspices of the Convention on, on Biological Diversity. So we are uh, at, a, at a right time to be able to talk about these things. Uh, the focus of my comments today will be on two things. Um, I think it's firstly very important to contextualize climate change uh, in the broader sustainability challenges faced by the world so that we do not lose sight of this broad picture. And, and this is the point that David was making. Um, climate action and climate change, it's not a singular item. Uh, it is a critical piece, but a, a critical piece of a bigger picture. And so I want to touch upon the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals, or, or as they are more commonly referred to as the SDGs, uh, and the role that the postal sector can and actually does play in supporting those. Uh, my second um, uh, focus uh, by way of comment uh, is to talk a bit about the sustainability priorities of the UPU and its role in sustainable development, given our status as an intergovernmental organization and, and, and part of the UN common system and, and a specialized agency within that system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, many, the, the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals illustrate the variety of sustainability topics that UN member states have agreed to work on. And, and these range from poverty and climate change to gender equality. Now, these goals uh, are a key part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which also emphasizes the deep connections between these SDGs. And so you've got to see them as, as part of a bigger picture. Now, the global postal network um, has the potential to support each of these UN SDGs, either directly or indirectly. Um, and, and it arises from the very simple point that postal services connect people, businesses, and governments. And in essence, it fosters inclusion. So we heard a lot about the examples that um, Anne Post is involved with. And, 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 and when I think about those, ultimately it, it, it comes down to this point about connecting people, businesses, and, and fostering inclusion. Um, and so 
in terms of inclusion, it, it ranges from social inclusion, financial inclusion, uh, and the inclusion of uh, SMEs in national and international trade networks. And, and in all of these things, the post can play a role. Quite importantly, in partnership with governments, the post can uh, be a purvey of health and safety information. Uh, it can be a conduit of social security payments. Um, and importantly, a touch point for the manifold interactions that governments have with citizens, uh, from identity services to food parcel deliveries. Now, despite this broad support for sustainable development, many of these social and economic benefits um, come uh, at an environmental cost. And I, and I think uh, we all understand um, that, you know, there are greenhouse gas emissions uh, from operating postal vehicles and buildings. Um, and, and that the postal network generates a considerable level of waste materials and water through its operations as a major employer. And so therefore it's beholden on us uh, to try and find some of these solutions uh, in, in relation to climate action. Next slide, please. So sustainability is indeed the big issue of our time and climate change in many respects is at its center. Now, limiting the, uh, the severity of climate change is a clear priority for sustainable global trade. However, it seems to me that the key challenge for the postal sector is not only to massively reduce uh, our footprint, our environmental footprint in terms of reducing emissions, waste, and so on, but it's also about simultaneously protecting and expanding its social and economic impact. And this means working on multiple fronts. Uh, and this is a point, Derek, you were making uh, in terms of the partnerships we develop, but also ensuring that these actions are coordinated and that we achieve synergies and we exploit those synergies. Next slide, please. It goes without saying that as a UN specialized agency, the UP is committed to supporting uh, the UN SDGs. Um, our reach is global uh, and our close connections with governments, postal operators and civil society and the technical know-how that is in this house means that the UP is strategically well placed to act as a key platform for knowledge, best practice and policy development and sharing, stakeholder engagement and regulatory frameworks. In particular, and, and this is something that is sometimes seen as a burden, the universal service obligations promoted by the UPU's treaties allows it to help its member countries advance social, economic, and political inclusion. And, and, and through that, we actually reach the most isolated in our societies. The UP is active in a whole range of areas from raising awareness about the existing value uh, propositions of the post uh, for social and economic development, to working closely with post and least developed countries and developing countries. And of course, as many of you are aware, the Secretariat of the UP also offers technical assistance and capacity building on topics such as measuring greenhouse gas emissions from postal operations, reducing waste from e-commerce and diversifying into offering social services. Next slide, please. I now want to turn to some of the UPU's sustainability priorities for the Abidjan cycle, as many of you are aware as well, that um, a Congress, uh, our plenipotentiary meeting of, uh, of member states uh, was recently held in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the 27th Congress. And arising out of that were a number of very critical uh, decisions, which in effect sort of set uh, and will frame uh, our sustainability priorities for what we refer to as the Abidjan cycle, which is for the next four years. Now, climate action is clearly a sustainability priority for the UPU. The, the greenhouse gas footprint of the postal sector makes this a, a must uh, uh, focus. Um, Particularly notable is the adoption uh, at the 27th Congress of a resolution to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this res excuse me, this resolution includes uh, three new work proposals that aim to establish voluntary targets for reducing emissions from postal operations. Um, a, a second pillar around increasing knowledge sharing and assistance between member states on emissions and resilience. And thirdly, developing standards for carbon neutral international uh, postage, um, thus allowing emissions from international mail and parcels to be offset. 
We're also looking to develop a climate delivery plan that will provide an overarching framework for and bring together uh, these various climate related activities. Uh, and, 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 and again, um, by way of um, uh, pillars, there are three of them. Uh, emissions reduction being one, uh, being a key priority, um, infrastructure resilience, and, and finally, postal climate services. And this is about the, uh, the, the sort of business side of things and, 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 and the fact that um, focusing on climate action can actually make business sense for the post. Next slide, please. Just turning to social sustainability priorities, and this is that broader picture that I was talking about. Um, we have a, a number of things on the social sustainability front, which will be uh, a focus for us. Uh, one major priority is, is, is the mandate to advance gender equality uh, in the UPU as well as in the postal sector more generally. Um, we adopted a resolution at the 27th Congress, uh, which will seek to uh, empower the role of women and enhance the role of women in the postal sector. It, in fact, um, uh, instructs the International Bureau to develop a, a, a policy on gender and to promote more broadly the role of, the, uh, of women in, 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 in the postal sector. Uh, we'll, of course, continue to support our members to expand their range of postal social services in areas such as uh, government services, government identity services, and to be a partner of government in, in, in e-government, um, education and, and welfare. Now, quite uh, notably and, and, and quite recently, we launched um, uh, what's referred to as the Post for Health facility. Uh, and this is intended to support the growth in postal health services, the idea being um, to encourage postal involvement uh, in a whole range of health services. Um, uh, a major focus, of course, is um, the COVID-19 uh, response by governments and particularly around vaccination campaigns. But the idea more broadly is to enable POST to, uh, to, to have a capability bill uh, and, and to also advocate uh, for a role of the POST uh, in the provision of health services. Next slide, please. Now, turning to... Um, economic sustainability. And, and here we've got quite a few uh, priorities given the, the role that the post plays in, 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 in economics and trade. Um, and, and I wanted to just focus on two in, in particular. First is our work on the role of the post in financial inclusion. We continue to be a knowledge center and a platform for best practice sharing uh, in this domain through our policy research and advocacy advoc activities. Uh, we are also using what's referred to as the um, Financial Inclusion Technical Assistance Facility, um, working closely with uh, both private sector and government partners, uh, which aim, and, and this facility aims to support uh, designated operators in leveraging technology to, to offer financial services to people with limited access. Uh, we've also uh, have as a, uh, as, a, as a major highlight of our work in economic sustainability, um, the, 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 a focus on trade facilitation and the role of the post in this. Now, through partnerships with other trade-focused international organizations such as UNCTAD and, 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 and the WTO, we are ensuring that governments in developing and least developed countries uh, are engaging the post in national e-commerce and trade development. In essence, it's about stressing uh, the postal sector's advantage in facilitating trade, both in terms of network reach, community knowledge and trust, as well as postal capability bill to ensure that the postal services that are on offer are exactly what citizens and businesses are demanding offers. Finally, Derek, um, and next slide, please. My key message here is that Climate action is clearly vital, and there is much to be done in the postal sector with respect to its environmental footprint. Uh, climate action not only makes business sense, but it is also now becoming a moral imperative given the unprecedented climate risk the world faces. Um, however, it is also important that we do not lose uh, sight of the other sustainability challenges the world faces. Uh, the climate actions we take must also support the broader contribution of the postal sector to social and economic development. This will sometimes entail a hard balancing act, but one that we must be prepared to undertake and, and succeed in. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much, uh, Siva. 
and uh, again, very comprehensive explanation of the range of, of things that we as a sector can be involved with that UPU is coordinating. So just to come to the panel session now and we can bring, uh, if the technicians can bring David and Siva back into the, the frame. Um, thank you for your presentations and uh, we haven't got Anne-Marie, but she obviously gave a clear presentation beforehand. And there are a couple of things I would bring out first, but I'll invite also those joining online to uh, submit questions and, uh, questions and comments. We've already got one or two, which I'll refer to in a minute. But just to start with, to kick off, uh, you both mentioned, in fact, all three presentations mentioned the, the need to collaborate and the huge impact we can have as a sector potentially. And I know that some sectors, not not the postal parcel, the postal logistics sector, are going to COP26 with a, a sector plan for net zero, if you know what I mean, a cross sector. I don't know if we need a sector wide uh, initiative as such, whether that's even feasible, but that would make a lot of sense because we have we have as a sector, we are really covering a lot of uh, transport and infrastructure and supply chains, which can influence up and down the supply chain. And if we can have that influence, maybe we can have as much influence, if not more influence than governments and politicians. So how, how can we leverage that influence we have in the infrastructure, in the everyday life of business and people? Uh, I don't know who wants to take that first, perhaps David. Sure, thanks, thanks, Derek. I, I mean, look, I think, uh, I think it would, you know, should we have had as an industry-wide uh, uh, a, a sectoral presentation, COP26? Possibly, probably. Um, and uh, certainly it's going to be very important, COP26. I think the issue around postal is despite, I mean, you are right, the postal have very large fleets, transport fleets, but overall postal is not a large uh, emitter of, of carbon compared to other industries. So. Um, you know, other industries, particularly, obviously, of course, energy industries, et cetera, have, have a much greater need uh, and they've more work to do there. Where postal is more complex and I, I think is a, is a the much more difficult issue for postal in relation to climate action is our indirect impact. You know, it's the indirect, it's the circular economy, it's, the, it's, it's not just packaging, but it's the consumption that is driven by e-commerce. Um, now, e-commerce is good for our industry because we deliver things and we like delivering things. Um, and yes, I think all our focus quite rightly isn't reducing or eliminating carbon in our delivery of these things, but still doing so is perhaps facilitating um, uh, an economy that is not sustainable. So the really big question, and, and I don't have an answer for it, but I think it's, a, it's important to recognize the question, the really big question for the industry going forward, maybe a very big question for UPU is, uh, and uh, Siva has touched on a fair bit of this in his presentation, but we don't yet have the answers as to how far, how deep into the supply chains we should go to be able to drive and ensure sustainability. They may not be on our balance sheets, on our carbon balance sheets, but they're undoubtedly part of this broader agenda. So I think it's it's a big question that we've got to answer in the next few years. Thank, thank you, David. And I know quite a lot of big brands are looking at decarbonizing their supply chain, even if their own uh, their own direct impact is small. When you take science-based targets and scope two and three and everything else, it expands it out. So, Siva, if I could put it to you, uh, then sure. uh, should we be should we see e-commerce growth and actually thinking really somehow or another we should not be party to this? We should be actually thinking about how we can reduce the the resource, uh, the, you know, this this festive uh, in, uh, increase in your resources and supplies. Derek, maybe if I can just step back and go back to your first question, which you posed to David, because I think okay. it's important to um, to set the context of the work that we're going to be doing on this front. Um, coming out of the 27th Congress in Abidjan, there was a clear direction from ministers uh, that uh, we as an intergovernmental institution 
should uh, focus on the postal sector, should be looking to develop uh, voluntary targets for the sector as a whole, or at least to start talking about it with a view to developing those targets. Uh, there was a, a clear recognition that um, however small the impact might be, we do actually account uh, for uh, a level of, uh, uh, of a footprint on the environment. Uh, and it was important to, to start that discussion uh, in, 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 in the UPU uh, with a view to looking uh, and defining the way forward. Uh, but there was also, as part of that uh, exercise, a recognition that much of this has also got to be done in the context of nationally determined contributions in you know the, the, the lingo that's used in the Paris Agreement, where um, countries sort of voluntarily put forward what they're seeking to do by way of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, carbon uh, mitigation measures. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the, the, the postal sector, be it at a national level or globally, can actually be part of that conversation and should be part of that conversation. And, and so um, the, 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 the stage has been set for that discussion to take place in the UPU and, 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 and it will progress. Um, and, 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 and it is in that context, which I think uh, we will begin to start some of the more uh, sort of operational discussions that David was referring to in terms of, you know, it, it, to what depth do we take uh, uh, the focus to? Are we, are we going to look, look at things from packaging down to uh, transportation uh, and so on and so forth? So uh, it will be a, a quite, an, uh, uh, quite a, uh, an exercise. But what I would say is that it's not, gonna next, it's, it's, it's not an exercise that ends in the next two or three years. It's, 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 a, it's a dialogue which hopefully will result in, in clear outcomes and commitments. And it's going to have to be an ongoing dialogue uh, that continues uh, uh, so long as we're all part, part, uh, part of the world and, and part of this environment. Uh, and which means that I, I remain optimistic that at some point, uh, perhaps uh, by the next COP, uh, the, the postal sector will have something to actually bring to the table in terms of uh, the contributions it might make uh, to, uh, to climate, climate action. Thank you, and I, I think I think when we look at the fuel and the uh, electrifying vehicles and the emissions, that's a given. We must tackle that. We have large fleets, and whether it's biofuels or electrification or renewable fuels, as same as our energy consumption, we have to we have to deal with that. It's a given, but that in itself is not enough. There's a much many other things that we need to we need to address. And I was just thinking. Going to the other end of it, and you mentioned the packaging. We've heard about the, the transporting air, and uh, other people are talking about. Uh, I had a question here about the number of items that are redirected and unnecessarily unnecessary journeys that are going that we can perhaps be more efficient with, or reduce mileage, or reduce unnecessary work, reduce waste essentially. Uh, there are obviously quite a lot of initiatives that we could focus on and ensure are carried out globally with using the facilitating the UPU's uh, uh, framework. Um, so is there a scope, do you think, for a resource available where people can find out, you know, new on a pragmatic basis, smart ideas, ways of doing things more efficiently, reducing waste, smart things so we can share these more widely because obviously it's good that some people are doing them but everybody needs to do them and i mean it's same with uh, david's initiative in in ireland for going to the post office and getting a your green deal for your you know making improving the heat uh, sustainability of your home and things like that there are lots of smart ideas we need to share them more broadly don't we Siva, is that something, a role that the UPU can play? Sure, Derek, and, and absolutely. Um, uh, what, what I would say uh, in, in terms of um, the role that the UPU can play on this front, it, it sort of has three dimensions to it. The, the first dimension is exactly what you talked about in terms of knowledge sharing uh, and, and creating a platform within which that knowledge is shared, best practice is shared, uh, and the ability for uh, member governments and operators and, and, and the private sector, we've got to really make sure that we do engage the private sector in these discussions because there is a lot to learn from the private sector as well. Uh, and, 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 and the UPU can play that and we will be playing that. Um, the, the second um, dimension to this is um, 
I think in some ways we've got to sort of revisit a lot of what we currently do in terms of postal operations under the treaties or in terms of the rules and ask ourselves, how can we actually green these? I mean, can, you know, do, does packaging have to be along the lines of the dimensions that are spelled out in the acts or do we start looking at uh, mandating things that will actually have a clear environmental impact? Uh, and, and so revisiting some of the things that we've always taken for granted and have always operated on is, 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 is also going to have some benefits. Uh, and, and, and thirdly, and, and this is a, a very key point, um, what we do need uh, in the UP is a, is a real commitment by member states uh, uh, by way of resources and a, a commitment to, to fund these activities. Um, you know, it is a it is a struggle um, uh, at at both national and at international level in the context of the pandemic and with the governments um, faced with massive budget deficits and and, and trying to find the funds to uh, to keep things going uh, to to actually have a focus on sustainability in an intergovernmental organisation and 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 so uh, you know again uh, through partnerships. Uh, through um, uh, uh, cooperation with governments as well as uh, private sector players, I think what what we can do is is bring a greater focus uh, on sustainability within the UPU, and again uh, looking at both uh, the, the 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 knowledge sharing uh, platform aspects, the review of existing operations, and also looking to the future in terms of what you know. I was really fascinated by what Anne Marie had to bring to the table in terms of getting rid of air and packaging. I mean, that's a, a fantastic idea because if you get it right, you effectively reduce uh, uh, cargo space and, and, and that sort of reduces weight on planes. And it, it has a knock-on impact across the whole supply chain and ultimately in terms of carbon emissions. So, you know, these are the sort of conversations we should have uh, if we, if we want to really uh, take the postal sector to the next level. Thank you. Yeah, there must be huge waste across our industry one way and another, even with the best of atten attention that we pay to it. David, I don't know if you want to add to any of the comments that Steve has just made. Yeah, look, I, 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 I quite agree with what Steve says. You know, we, I think there are opportunities at a UPU level to um, set some of the policies, relook at them. I think they have to, we have to move fast though. You know, this is uh, to, for all of us to hit our targets, if anybody who has a target of net zero by, by 2030, um, that's a pretty tough target to get to. So we need these initiatives to come through now. I think a really interesting one is the one you mentioned, Derek, about um, uh, you know, the, the, the waste from, for example, returning e-commerce, uh, returning parcels and, and return to sender. And it's, it's also a real issue, which is a very live issue right now, with the implementation of the new EU customs rules. And um, you know, the EU customs rules come in, they have a very serious impact. They have a very serious impact on postal and, and they're very important. And it's right to, you know, from our perspective, it's right to that a single market operates as a single market and within the EU, that is absolutely right. Um, but the whole issue as to postal regulation and how postal regulation interacts uh, with with customs is a really live issue right now and is is one where the UPU plays an essential role. Um, it's it's not one, it's difficult for a national operator to do that, but it is possible for the UPU. Um, and certainly reducing um, the, the number of uh, and the amount of, of parcel returns is a very, very direct, I and mean, that's 100% saving in the air around a parcel um, if you just don't send it and um, you know have to send it back so i think that's really important i did see a note by the way which i should acknowledge um uh that came up from the chat which said look e-commerce is not all negative and that's absolutely true you know e-commerce of course so just as we talk about how far up the supply chain should we go the other issue is how far down the supply chain can we can we affect and take credit for that so if you're stopping people making unnecessary shopping trips, or if you're if you're reducing that, then of course you have an impact. One of the big areas, by the way, that we look at, which is I think is a really key one, is PUDO pick up and drop off. You know, and actually a good PUDO network 
can massively reduce the number of unnecessary trips that consumers have to make. Um, so getting all of those pieces right also is a real opportunity. And I do think the opportunity is there, um, Siva, as Derek has suggested, for much more sharing of the experiences that different uh, postal operators have with different initiatives. Because there is a great, great energy out there in terms of, of reducing uh, carbon. And it's fabulous to see, but it's great to be able to learn from it as well. And, and you're, you're right, David, just at the moment, the proliferation of regulations around cross-border movements is causing a great deal of unnecessary uh, movements, returns and backwards and forwards of parcels and re really uh, an inhibitor of, of, of cross-border movement, which is a problem for everybody. But can I just come back to you, the, the point, to build on the point you just made about PUDOs and about uh, what you made earlier on, I think you referred to when you talk about cities and, you know, congratulations on all your emission-free cities, but uh, it's still congestion is sometimes an issue and also duplication. There's a lot of duplication. So, I mean, in London is well documented, 30,000 vehicles and often several vehicles of different colours going up the same street on the same day. Um, somehow or another there should be an opportunity and this might tie in with your point about decent work as well and undercutting is actually there should be an opportunity for consolidation and maybe some places i know in europe have already tried this and others are trying it to consolidate on the outskirt of cities and just going in with fewer much more uh, environmentally friendly vehicles and rather than having big trucks from multi multiple operators or going in and some of them, if you like, not regulated in or, or responsible in the way that we would be responsible. So uh, I, is that behind what you were saying earlier on, David? Yes, and, and certainly that project, Senators, is called in Dublin. It's, I think there was a similar project in Zaragoza uh, in Spain, I think it was, and uh, you know, and that's looking at the uh, possibility of, of sharing the last mile and um, so that you consolidate and then have, have one delivery in the last mile, which is, it seems to make sense and could be an opportunity. Got to be careful about competition effects and, and those sorts of issues. But, you know, as an industry, I'm sure we can, we can look at those and resolve those. Um, and that will actually have to be part of it. You know, we can't have our, 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 our towns and cities just simply cannot take the amount of vehicles that are in them. And um, I, of course, would be a great advocate for the, the National Postal Organization being that, that last mile, but others might have different views. I do think, however, it has to be electric vehicles, has to be trained, eco-trained drivers, has to be responsible drivers. Um, and, and I think it's, it's that element of standards that I really think both the UPU should be pushing, local posts should be pushing, but also we should be pushing our governments to make sure that those standards are in place. The one thing that is a real danger around sustainability is when the economics become unviable for a postal organization, because non-postal organizations doing deliveries who do not have those standards who evade um, the labor regulations, or, or I should be careful, who, who find ways to find loopholes in the labor regulations so that they're saving the 25 or 30% that is always the add-on to a salary. Um, so even if they paid the same amount, but they don't have to pay that, that's what's got to stop because there's no way um, postal organizations as committed as they are to sustainability should be forced into economic non-competitive, uncompetitive situation um, because of loopholes which others exploit. And that's fundamentally a role for government. And we're, we're huge employers as collectively as, a, as, a, as the postal industry. And we have a responsibility, if you like, to our staff to have good, decent work, as you put it, David. And so, so we need, somehow, Siva, we need a sustainable business model that is going to sustain uh, the operating model business financially for the post to provide decent jobs. And obviously there's a role for the regulators and the governments and not, um, hey, UPU is a government member organization, isn't it? So is there something that can be done there in terms of 
uh, along along those policy and regulation areas. Um, thanks, Derek. And it's a, it's a very good point because um, one of the things that um, that the UPU has uh, traditionally recognised as being uh, 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 a necessary focus are, are of course, um, uh, postal workers. Um, and in, in terms of policy settings and so on. Uh, but the approach has um, traditionally been to work with uh, organizations such as the International Labor Organization uh, in, in, in trying to bring forward uh, some of the developments in the ILO uh, and, and, and to have that uh, play a, a, a sort of a, a referential uh, a role in, in, in the work that's done in the UPU, as well as in terms of uh, the way we develop uh, postal operations uh, as defined by the acts. Um, there isn't a, a mandate per se uh, within our uh, uh, governing treaties uh, for the UPU to, to actually develop labor standards. Uh, it, it's not uh, a space within which our member governments uh, have given uh, the institution a, a clear role, uh, but it has been uh, along the lines of uh, understanding what best practices are uh, to, to promote uh, the standards that are being developed uh, in, in the ILO and, and at a national level to also engage with uh, uh, postal workers through their representatives, uh, through tripartite arrangements. Uh, and, and, and so um, it is um, still very much an indirect uh, nexus that we have. Uh, and, and that arises mainly because of the fact that we do not have an express mandate to talk and deal with labor standards. Thank you for that. And I'm just conscious that we're going to have to draw this very interesting discussion to a conclusion fairly soon. but. One of the things that, as an observer, I sort of feel concerned about is that there's a lot of ideas, a lot of discussion, a lot of talk, but how quickly is anything going to be happening? And is it going to happen fast enough and have significant impact enough? In other words, even COP26, it's important it's taking place, but is it really going to really get to grips and do enough in time? And I think there's a number of people who feel that it won't. Um, but I don't know how you feel looking forward, uh, and this is probably the final question, if I can ask you just to sort of think about going forward. Are we doing enough, fast enough? What more could we do? What more should we do? Uh, just as if you can encapsulate that uh, in a final answer, perhaps, David. Sure. Uh, well, look, I, I, I would say, Derek, I think, um, firstly, I think we are getting to grips, certainly as an industry, us ourselves, we are getting to grips with it. We've all brought, I, most postal organizations I see have brought forward targets. The most common target now is to get to net zero by 2030, um, as opposed to net zero by 2050. And we know the COP target is net zero by 2050. So, so we have pulled forward our targets um, and that is requiring a lot of actions to take place. You know, alongside it is innovation, the speed of innovation. You yourself mentioned the issue of whether, you know, we, we were sufficiently developing um, the, the, the network vehicles, in other words, the heavy goods vehicles um, that are uh, zero emission vehicles. Um, and they are now being developed. And I've no doubt, you know, we certainly will need to have them to hit our target of net zero by 2030. So I think that's a good example of how we're moving at a pace where um, at the moment the solutions that we plan to have in place aren't actually yet deliverable. Um, so you can't move much faster than that, I would argue. And so I think, I certainly think the postal by and large is doing that. Um, the issue overall around COP26, if that's a, a, a big enough target, is, is a question that will be beyond my competence. Um, I think we all are seeing and scrambling to see the need to accelerate. And uh, I think that that is something which is, is, is going to obviously be debated in Glasgow in November. So let's, let's hope we see that. Let's maintain that commitment. Um, we don't have all the solutions. None of us are all experts in this. Um, but if we, if we actually have the right culture and the determination to get there, um, I think we will do so, and particularly if we have the sort of projects that Anne-Marie was showing us earlier and some of the work that Siva has been sharing uh, today as well. 
Thank you, David. And one of the things I'm heartened by is just hearing this morning the experiences of so many posts in the face of the pandemic, how quickly they reacted, how agilely and how uh, flexibly they adapted their systems. If we adopt that sort of speed of reaction and change in the face of climate change, then we have some hope that we're going to be able to do things and make make a difference. So, Siva, a final comment from you, please. Sure, um, Derek. And in, in it, um, your your question reminded me of um, uh, of a comment that uh, Greta Thunberg uh, recently uh, uh, put out there in terms of uh, her perception of policymakers. We were all described as being involved in blah blah blah, uh, and 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 it's true. I, I think to some extent uh, it is true, and 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 it's uh, and it's uh, and it's a it's a it's a tremendous indictment uh, of of policymakers across the world, across all sectors. Um, as far as the postal sector is concerned, I think there's two things that I would uh, talk from the perspective of a of a representative of an, of an intergovernmental organisation. Uh, David is absolutely correct. There are absolute examples, brilliant examples out there in the marketplace of posts are doing um, and, 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 and picking up tremendous initiatives that are uh, going to have a, a significant impact on the environment, at least in their own national context. Uh, but from where I'm sitting, um, th th there are uh, challenges because um, what we are seeing, particularly amongst developed posts, is obviously a, a focus uh, on on sustainability and, and and climate action, and and they have the uh, the resources and the know how to be able to do this. Um, but that's not necessarily the case with uh, posts uh, in the developing world. Uh, and 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 as much as we talk about mitigation uh, measures and and and, uh, and 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 how we reduce uh, our climate footprint, uh, I think there needs to also be a focus on adaptation. Uh, and quite importantly, um, climate finance and, and how do we get all of us onto the same page? Uh, because the world is only a better place if we get everyone on the same page. Uh, and there is still quite a long journey uh, for many in the developing world to get there. And I, and I think this is a, a, a major challenge uh, for intergovernmental organizations, um, including the UPU as far as the postal sector is concerned. And, and the second thing is, um, you know the, the the way that we can avoid the blah blah uh, is is to make sure uh, that our commitments and whether they are voluntary or not uh, they are technically credible uh, they're well resourced and and quite importantly I think we, we we've got to actually map it out uh, across time and, and that is to say there are things that we can do right now that can have an impact and and we should do those things as quickly as possible. Uh, and then there are things that are a bit more long term and, and we, which we could focus on. And, and so those would be just the two things um, I'd, I'd put on the table uh, as far as policymakers should be concerned as, as, as we go forward. Thank you, Siva. You're right. We, we, there's an imperative for us to do so much and we need to do both the quick wins, the things that have immediate impact. Uh, but also some structural things, some longer term things that need to change in our sector as well. Uh, but effectively, we need to just redouble our efforts. And it's easily the most important agenda, because without this, we won't have any other agenda if we don't tackle the broader broader issues of sustainability. So it's, a, it's an all, all important uh, topic for us. And I'd like to thank both of you and obviously Anne-Marie for her contribution to the debate and it's something that will go on and uh, indeed uh, here in Vienna at the Post and Post Expo we've got a COP26 session going on Wednesday morning as well when we'll be addressing it again in a different way but for the time being thank you very much for your willingness to present and to discuss and answer questions thank you to those who've sent in comments and questions and we'll be returning at half past the hour again with the final panel session where we'll be reflecting on all that we've been discussing during the day. So for the time being, thank you very much. And we'll return in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you David. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, David. Thanks, Derek.
Good morning. Hello, hello, Michael. Are you?
Morning, Derek. That was me, Mike. Welcome, Mike. We're just about to start. Great. Welcome, Brody. Hello, Derek. Welcome, Thomas. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Tohilda. Hi, Jean Paul. I'm just about to open the session in a minute, but good to see you all ready for the panel session. This time. We have so many people on the screen anyway. Okay, shall I start? Okay, welcome back everybody to the UPU World Leaders Forum. Uh, this is the last session of what's been a very busy and fascinating day. We've had a lot of interesting uh, presentations and discussion and I'm just about to welcome our five panelists who are going to uh, think about and reflect and discuss what we've been hearing and address some of the challenges and opportunities facing our sector. Just uh, what I've noted down from today, for example, are topics like the reaction and the resilience of the sector to the pandemic, uh, the accelerated transformation as a result of that. Many people mentioned the, the catalyst of change, obviously going from more physical to operating in a digital world, uh, fairly obviously letters declining and parcels growing, the digital transformation that was necessary for, for that. A lot of talk about collaboration and partnerships and how that's become extremely important and the importance of um, uh, the communication to our customers and our senders, but also the customer experience and the customer journey, how vital it is to understand that and taking care of our people and being kind to ourselves and to others, as New Zealand uh, pointed out, David pointed out. And finally, just now we've had the whole sustainability discussion which is the wider climate action, but also uh, the use of resources, more responsible use of resources, decent work, circular economy, practical issues, wider issues. We've a lot to talk about. Um, I'm just going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves in a minute because it'll be quicker than me trying to read out a long bio for each of them. But uh, we've got Thomas from Slovenia, Tohilda, who you've already mentioned from I met, met from Icelandic Post, Brody Buller, who's the CEO of Escher Post, Jean-Paul Forsfield, some of you will know, who's from La Poste and chairman of the POC, and Mike Froman, who is joining us from MasterCard, who, uh, amongst other things, was involved with Obama and World, World Trade Facilitation as well. So can I just, in that order, just invite you very briefly to introduce yourselves to our audience. So Thomas first, perhaps. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I'm very honored and uh, grateful that I can be here with you today. Uh, at the same time, I'm very pleased uh, that we were given this opportunity by the UPU to share the good practice and the measure takes that I hope will help to improve us all businesses and performance even further. Uh, let me say that I'm very fascinated uh, by the efforts made by postal operators from around uh, the world. Uh, to continue uh, of postal services during the pandemic and the explosion of e-commerce, uh, post has a challenge for all of us. 
uh, a challenge we have never faced uh, before. And if uh, we add the aspect of sustainability to this situation, where we have uh, limited natural resources available, we are suddenly confronted with uh, exceptional challenge. So it is uh, our attitude towards uh, the nature and our failure to act on time that has brought us in this uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, let's move to uh, Torhilda. We heard from you before, but perhaps you could introduce yourself in case people weren't there earlier on. Hi, my name is Torhilda, and I'm CEO of Icelandic Post. And I can see that Derek is frozen, or blink your eyes. No, you're not frozen. <laughs> uh, it was very, I was very pleased to hear all the people who are, have given their time to speak today. It was very enlightening, especially the sustainability thing. I think it's a very huge step that we need to take as well. So I have already been introduced, so I will just give the next the word to the next. Okay, thank you for to Hilda. Now let's meet Brody, Brody Buller. He hasn't spoken yet this afternoon. Uh, Brody, you were in Accenture last time we, we met you. Now you're not. <laughs> that is correct, Eric. Good to be with you today. I'm uh, now the Chief Exec at Escher. I've been here for about uh, seven months now. And prior to that was uh, with Accenture for uh, about 22 years. Uh, all of that time in this sector, in the post and parcel sector. And I'll uh, echo what's been said in the previous sessions. This is a really exciting time in the industry, a really exciting time to be part of this, this industry. And I'm excited for this discussion today. So thanks for having me. Thank you. So you've been around the postal sector for a long time. And like me, we're recognizing that it's a critical time. There's lots going on, lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities. I think the same for you, Jean-Paul. Oh, can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. Yep, better. <laughs> better like that, no? Um, yeah, I joined La Poste um, more, more than 42 uh, two years ago. So <laughs> it's been a long journey. I'm happy to be with you today. I'm in charge of uh, uh, international and European relations for La Poste Group. As um, Post Europe Chair, I'm also happy to see two of CEO members. I have not had the opportunity yet to meet, uh, probably because of COVID-19, but uh, um, I hope that one day I will be able to uh, to meet them too. Um, happy to uh, to see again also Brody, uh, because we, we have been exchanging for years now uh, about the future of the uh, of the postal sector. And uh, yes, as you said, uh, Derek has been, I've been uh, elected in August, uh, POC chair uh, for uh, four years. So that's going to involve you quite a lot of opportunities to influence the way the global postal operations are going to be developing. So that's a very pivotal role, I think, uh, Jean-Paul. Uh, I'll come to Mike now. We haven't met before, but I'm very pleased to see you. And I understand you're working uh, with, uh, I think you're the vice chairman and president of strategic growth at MasterCard but by which you are, play a strategic role in business and have done in global trade. Uh, so perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about your background and how we might tap into your ex knowledge and experience for, for our sector. Well, thank you very much, Derek, and it's an honor to be here. I am certainly not an expert on postal uh, uh, unions, and so I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to, to be here and, and learn from all of you as well. Uh, as you mentioned, I've been in and out of government for most of my my life, having worked on trade and and now sustainability, but also very much on the impact of digitization on both business and government activity, and the importance of public-private partnerships in that regard, and how the private sector can work with public institutions like post offices to bring tools of the digital economy uh, together and to help them develop new ways of serving of serving their customers. So uh, very much look forward to our discussion. So very much in tune with uh, what we've been talking about, new ways to serving customers. Uh, but perhaps you'll start at that point if I can. And I'm going to start with Brody because as long as I've known you, you've been talking about digital transformation 
and what needs to happen in the in the sector and the opportunities. Uh, perhaps you can just expand on why this is such a critical moment for digital transformation. Absolutely. It, you heard from a number of the previous speakers today uh, of that transformation that's been occurring of post organizations uh, delivering a lot more parcels, in some cases, the bulk of their revenue now coming from parcels. And that uh, that's a very different type of business and a very different type of customer experience required within that business. And so that's where I think that's the catalyst for the transformation. As, as you look at what's happened with the, in the pandemic, some research that we've done shows that that device, the, your, your phone has really become the command center of your life. And I'll just give you a simple example. You know, during the pandemic, you, when you couldn't, couldn't go out, I needed to uh, um, have a quick doctor's appointment. I did the whole thing on my phone. Right. Uh, I uh, hopped on. They said, wait five minutes and the doctor will join. They texted me when the doctor was ready. I clicked the link, did a virtual appointment. Uh, she prescribed a, a medication and that was delivered to my home. Uh, what would have been a, you know, a two hour drive to the office, uh, be seen, drive home, drive, get the, uh, get the prescription was all done in a, um, uh, in a matter of about 10 minutes, uh, while I was driving somewhere, I was, I wasn't even, uh, <laughs> I wasn't even at home when I did this virtual appointment. So that's the sort of change that has occurred of kind of this, uh, mobile relevance in that, and that device driving a, a different type of experience. And that's where I think digitization really needs to, to move from a postal perspective as you think about those deliveries and the control insight, visibility, um, and, and ability to really interact on that mobile device, it becomes an imperative really uh, going forward. And then there's all the digitization in the back office, uh, automation and, uh, and equipment sorts of uh, investments that need to be made. But from a customer experience, it really starts with that device. And I think if I can move to Torhilda, you, you mentioned that when you talked about your apps and you're getting really closer to your customers and what they need. Is that right? It's it's quite clear. We we found in in the pandemic, we people were trying to reach out to callers, so we do need to get the app up straight away to get the information to the customers right away. They needed the information. They needed to know where their packets were, or where where to pick it up, and etc. So, I think it's uh, necessary to put the information to the customers right away. I'm just int intrigued, you don't have to answer this, but I'm intrigued if the pandemic hadn't happened, would you have moved so fast to introduce an app like that? Or would it have taken some years to get it, to get developed and, and in implemented? I think we would have uh, gone this fast because we had already made the decision in 2019 to go through with the app. So I think so, but uh, maybe not as fast. It probably, as you said, accelerated things you already had in motion. Yeah. Thomas, uh, in Posta Slovenia, again, a smallish post, but I think you've been engaged in a lot of digital transformation. Yes. Um, so I, as, as I'm one of the younger participants here, and um, what, I, what I can say is that uh, my children will probably have uh, their children around 2050. And so from my point of view, 2050 is not so, so far away. And uh, for me, it's very uh, closer a statement that uh, we don't inherit the land uh, from our ancestors. Uh, we borrow it from our children. Because of that, I see uh, the ecological aspect with very great uh, respect. And uh, Slovenian Post uh, owner, uh, trust me, we run a state-owned company with almost 8,000 employees and we are in nine countries and uh, this year we expect the, the the highest volume of packages and letters and parcels mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the slovenian market is with own two million inhabitants and it's very open economy and thus started to become too small and uh, this year is expected to 
be our best year, both in terms of uh, revenue and in terms of profit. Okay, congratulations for that. And it sounds like things are progressing well. We'll come back to you in a minute, uh, Thomas. Jean-Paul, uh, digital transformation in the postal sector, and you'll be uh, chair now of the POC, uh, is not always noted for things ha change happening very fast. How do you see things progressing in the next cycle? Well, I, I, I think that in the global range of post, um, there, there is a, a huge diversity. Uh, some have engaged and are, are, are really leaders on this and uh, have made lots of efforts uh, to, to develop uh, their, their um, uh, digital equipment and digital offer. Um, th th there has been some time in, in, in some post, I'm sure, for instance, debates. Uh, should we encourage uh, the digital registered mail or should we keep our old uh, register mail because it, 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 it was a very profitable activity. And, um, but now you, you, you have no choice. You, you really have to speed up and, 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 and to, to, to deliver. If you want to be one of the um, provider on this digital world and with the e-commerce even uh, uh, more and more true, you, 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 you have to, to, to be digital, you, you have to, deliver um, information on your packets or, or on your uh, uh, parcels if you want to send them to some countries, uh, Europe or, uh, uh, or, or US, for instance. So really, you, you have no choice anymore. And I think that um, for some time now, um, the, uh, the UPU and the POC uh, have uh, developed a practice on, 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 on this, uh, trying to, to, to benchmark. Um, but I, I think that we, we really have to, to, to speed up and um, uh, to benefit from the experience of the most advanced to, to teach uh, the, 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 the others. Maybe also some providers like Escher can uh, also help many posts to, 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 to go digital. And so it, it is a, a global move uh, to, to, to uh, make the one who are less advanced. And also a message uh, to, the, um, to the government or the owners of the post. Uh, it will need a little money to do so. And um, guys, be aware that uh, the, 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 the post, uh, your post, your designated operator um, will need uh, not much. <laughs> it, it's not the, at the, at the height of the telecommunications sector, but at least. And um, you, you, you liked having the post during the COVID-19. Don't forget about it and, 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 and be ready to, to help your post to migrate to the new world. Thank you. And, and you're right. I mean, there, there's a requirement to invest in technology. And we said earlier on, I mean, when Pascal Tiva was on, we were talking about in the developing countries, it's not necessarily expensive. It's perhaps possible to leapfrog. We've had a number of comments and questions from African countries, amongst others today in the Q&A. And really, relatively small amounts of tech investment can move, go a long way. But when we also heard from some of the sharing this morning about AED, for example, advanced electronic data and CDS, these are global systems that could improve the collaboration and the, and the quality and the efficiency of the whole postal network if everybody's doing what they need to do. And that's, 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 it needs everybody to play together, which is obviously a, a role for the UPU and the POC to play to get everybody to raise, level up everybody, if I can use that expression, to the same level so that uh, they're all, all, all in the same way. Um, if I can come to Mike now, perhaps, and say, we in the postal sector, talking about a number of us who've been around for years, think we're moving quite fast and think we're going, we're changing quite fast from where we've come from. But then, you know, you heard on the, if you saw some of the presentations, Mexico is 400 and something years old and many of our organizations are hundreds of years old. So it's relatively speaking, we've come a long way, but maybe we've got a long way to go. So coming from the outside, looking in, and uh, with your experience in other industries and other sectors, what is your message perhaps, or what is your perspective on, on the, 
what is needed in the postal sector uh, in view of how things are developing. Now we're all living in a digital world now. Well, I think as you suggested earlier, uh, the pandemic probably accelerated trends that were well underway before, including the digitization of, of, uh, of the postal uh, sector. It's not new to the postal sector to be focused on this, but it has certainly shown a spotlight and underscored just how important it is to move and, and to move further more quickly. One thing that the pandemic showed is just how critically important digital inclusion is, whether you're a, an individual getting assistance from your government. And we found a lot of governments having difficulty being able to deliver assistance in what had been previously either cash or check based systems that required face to face interaction, or whether you're a small business uh, trying to get access to capital, trying to serve your customers, uh, moving from being brick and mortar to becoming an e-commerce player, going online for the first time, engaging with a lot of these issues around um, the shipping of goods that they previously didn't have to, uh, to, to, to focus on. And the digitization uh, can make this all much more efficient. It doesn't eliminate the need for brick and mortar physical presences, but gives post offices the opportunity to use digital tools to better serve their customers, increase their efficiencies, and perhaps expand the range of, of services they can offer. Uh, to some of the, the last couple of points that have been mentioned, this can be facilitated very much by public-private partnership, where the private sector, which has really moved very quickly ahead on digitization, can bring resources, expertise, um, skills, and tools to the public sector in a way, in a, in a co-creation sort of mode that can, that can really benefit, uh, that can benefit both. Now, the last thing I would say, Derek, is, is one thing that post offices have going for them. They are a, uh, they are a trusted network in their countries. Uh, it's something that everybody can relate to and have full trust in. And we MasterCard views ourselves as a trusted network in the, in the payment space, but it's a critical value to have that trust and to build on that trust in a way that you can provide services safely and securely you know, as we enter this new age. And, and therefore, I think post offices are really well positioned to partner with the private sector to, to go further into this area. I think that's absolutely true. And I think that was underlined during the pandemic where uh, post in by and large were identified as an essential service, a trusted service to deliver medicines, goods, food, care, all kinds of other things. And I think we we uh, often take for granted the trust that people pl place in us. And actually, it's a really valuable asset, as, as well as the brand and the reach and, and the knowledge that people have, as well as our people. Our people have a valuable asset and very often go beyond the call of duty. So thank you for making that point. And it's nice to hear it from the outside looking in, if you know what I mean. Um, but also to your point that we're not alone in facing digital disruption. I mean, we sometimes think that we're the only ones who are having to adjust. But I think about the retail sector, the finance sector and the banking sector and every other sector, really, they're all grappling with same similar issues, aren't they, really? But can I just pick up on the uh, to go on to the next topic, really, which is to follow up on your talk point about partnerships and collaboration, private public partnerships. Yes, we're great public organizations to which private companies should really see an opportunity to partner and hopefully invest in to get coverage and reach, as well as to get access to new technologies. And we don't have to do it all ourselves. We don't have to have all the money ourselves. We don't have to have all the investment. We can do it with others. And Brody, as a, as a private company, but partnering with the Post in many parts of the world, how do you see that developing and how can that accelerate a little bit more in terms of sharing technology, sharing risk, moving the pace a bit more? There's a significant potential there. As I look at uh, posts reworking the role they play within the ecosystem, uh, the, you know, some of the things that have already been mentioned around trust, uh, physical presence, the, nobody's more local than a post. And so being able to leverage those differentiated capabilities with other organizations, whether it's with banks so that you're uh, in creating more uh, banking inclusion, uh, dealing with banking deserts, those sorts of things, whether it's around uh, identity and that identity proofing then 
uh, being leveraged into other areas. I think there's remarkable partnership opportunities as posts use the assets that they have, the differentiated capabilities that they have uh, in, in very different ways with, uh, with uh, organizations, both within the logistics sector, as well as outside. Thank you. Yeah, we are local, but we're also global. And I think that struck me this morning when I was listening to all the presentations from whether it be Fiji or New Zealand or Mexico or Iceland or Singapore, a lot of the themes were quite common, uh, different experience of them, but similar themes. And it'd probably be the same if we visited all 192 postal administrations or however many they are. So quite similar challenges, but actually could be a force to be reckoned with when we're partnered together globally. Uh, Torhilda, in your development of digital activity in Iceland, are you forging partnerships? How are you approaching that? Um, we are partnering with Western Union in Iceland, for example, for mm -hmm. uh, transferring money for people around Iceland. And we are, like if you saw my presentation this morning, our, we are a big country with few people who are living here. So it's not for everybody to be everywhere, but in Iceland, the Icelandic Post is everywhere. So I think it's very good for us to partner up with uh, local delivering companies like DHL. They are moving things with us around the country, not in the capital, but in the in the country. I think it's very important to work with others in that sense. There are a lot of opportunities like that in different parts of the world where there are different operators, different uh, people with different expertise who can partner either in our operational challenges or, as you say, in, in finance, in money, money services and financial services or, or, or many other things. And we, we don't have to be the experts. I say we, the postal operators, don't have to be. We're not bankers. We're not necessarily warehouse runners. We're not doing all sorts of things. We can partner or we can expand, as you heard from Singapore, where they've expanded out into different sectors uh, by diversifying, which is another approach as well. So. Thomas, perhaps have you have you got some partnerships or collaboration in Slovenia? It's a, again, it's a it's a small country, but with big ambitions, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, so I'm coming from the ICT sector. And I can say that uh, and confirm that the employees are the most important part of the service industry. And we, we should uh, collaborate uh, each other. And uh, what I can uh, prove uh, with uh, what Michael said before, you know, that uh, postmen of the National Post are highly respectful and uh, most of the time highly welcome. Uh, to the homes uh, and people uh, trust them, uh, even if sometimes brings uh, some bad news. But the most times I'm good news and packages and parcels and, and so on. So uh, for me, it's personally that uh, we as a manager, we can do and uh, work together and we need to help uh, to, to, to our employees and bring them a goodwill and communication. So I talk uh, with my employees almost every month and I inform them about the, 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 the new news, new things. And if need, uh, I of course share also some bad news with them. And uh, honestly to saying is that is what people appreciate. Uh, so I regularly visit our post offices uh, around uh, the country and uh, I talk uh, with my co-workers because uh, I believe that we all have to do our best uh, to create a pleasant uh, working uh, environment. And when the, our uh, employees are satisfied, it's the first phase uh, against the, the our citizens. So if I can say we are the face of the state because we are state owned uh, company uh, against the citizens. So it has to be all done very smoothly and, uh, and, and with all the respect. So it's really important to communicate honestly and engage with your staff to ensure they understand what's, what's needed and to support them in their activity, day-to-day -day activities. And in many cases, I think now, 
not just in Slovenia, but elsewhere, they're acting as this physical, this bridge between the physical and digital. In other words, quite often they're, they're turning up at people's houses with uh, all the services on their mobile device. So they've got the, all the services with them, but they're physically able to deliver them to the customers, which I think is appreciated because one of the things that's appreciated from, from ever for the post is that personal service, the, the, the mailman visiting the visiting and that's still a moment. Uh, we always talked about the mail moment. Now it's a different kind of moment perhaps, but uh, certainly there was quite a lot of uh, checking in on people to see if they were okay during the pandemic, which was a very valuable social uh, element. Jean-Paul, perhaps you could comment about um, either from La Poste perhaps perspective or, or from the POC perspective about partnerships and collaborations. I know La Poste is very busy in the digital sphere and with digital developments, but also in corporate social responsibility as well. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we came, La Poste first, uh, yeah. some words about La Poste. We came for a period of time where we were trying to invent or reinvent everything by ourselves. Um, we were, we come from an administration, we are uh, a company since uh, 1990, but you know, in, in, in the mind, in, in our mind, uh, and also because of the, the, the size of the company, uh, there was nothing on the market uh, to, to, to fulfill our, some of our, of our needs and we, we, we had to try and, and, and invent everything. Now it's over, uh, and especially in the ICT, we, we try to, to partner with the uh, um, uh, providers. We, we try also to entertain a network of startups ar around us uh, to, to benefit from their know-how and, uh, and sometimes we buy some of them uh, when uh, the, the, the technology is very relevant for us or, or crucial. We, we can have also an interest to, 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 to buy it. As for globally, the, the, the partnership and, 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 and the UPU, it is, as you know, uh, Derek, also in the middle of the debate of the opening of uh, uh, the, the, uh, yes. the UPU, which is a, a kind of touchy issue. Um, even if we have come to a consensus in, in, in Abidjan and that we, we have a plan to make decisions in 2023. So I think nobody now at the UPU uh, is against um, the, the, the opening and, 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 and to enlarge the possibilities of, of partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, and here again, there is a huge diversity of operators. We are more uh, at POC uh, level talking about the, 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 the operators, uh, but um, globally we can say the situation is different. And, um, you know, um, a small African or Asian um, um, uh, operator can be a little, I would say, afraid or doesn't know exactly what he can expect from a partnership with big players uh, from outside. And this has to be better explained. And um, I, I think that in the coming uh, year, because 2023 will come very soon, so we, we, we have to, to, to make things clearer, quicker, um, and, and also from uh, what we call the, the private sector, even if uh, more and more um, postal operators are also private now, um, <laughs> the, the, the private sector has to, to, to explain a little more about what the, the, the win-win uh, solution could be in, in, in the partnerships. And once more, it can be very different from one and, or another uh, operator, postal operator, because the situation can be very different from one to the other. Exactly, thank you. And, and Mike, if I can come to you, I mean, I'm sure it's part of MasterCard's business model to be in partnership, because I mean, you do very little, in, well, I say, I don't know, I don't know about your business model, but uh, my assumption is that it's very much a part based on partnerships with pretty well every other sector for whom you provide payment services. Is that right? Well, it's absolutely right. We partner with, with just about everybody, uh, governments, other private sector parties, international organizations uh, and the like, and fintechs, new startups. Um, it's, it creates a very dynamic environment. And I'd say when it comes to 
the, the postal sector, I'll just give you three quick examples. One in the UK where we partnered, our Vocalink company partnered with local banks and the post office to provide basic banking services at 30,000 postal counters because 94% of the public live within a mile of a post office. Which so it was great. not area to do that. Or you, you mentioned uh, non-payment services in Australia. We used our digital identity capabilities working with Australia Post to make it possible for people to prove their identity without having to hand over physical documents. And that I think is a model for, for taking elsewhere. And then of course, with the UPU itself, we've, we have been working with you on a tool to help uh, postal payment ecosystems be tested for their readiness for e-commerce and what needs to be done to upgrade them so that they can fully participate in the dramatic increase of e-commerce over the last couple of years. Uh, so these are just some of the examples of partnerships we, we are doing um, with the postal sector. I think it's a wide open field. There's so many more ways where the private sector in the, in the right kind of engagement with, uh, with, with post offices can bring their technology, their expertise, their networks, and, and add to what post offices already have in a very powerful way. And we look forward to working with the Escher Group, of course. We look forward to working with others here to, to try and explore that. You know, in a way, everybody can work with everybody, which should be the ideal. So uh, you, you're right, when posts are looking to go up the up and down the e-commerce ecosystem or value chain, whichever way like, you'd like to put it, payment systems are part of the glue, as long as, as well as transport and distribution and IT and uh, tracking, tracing and all these other things, which all have to be integrated, all have to be involved, predicted, predicated on partnerships. So uh, really, really important to collaborate with everybody. But uh, I'm, we must talk about sustainability. It's, it's the big issue of our time. And it's, you know, I, I said earlier on in the session just before this one that it's it sort of supersedes all the other agendas. It sort of has a, a an impact. And I just would like to get each of your take on how that should be, how the industry, our sector should be responding or what do you think is the most important thing or what is your view on what is critical. And I'll go in the same order if you like, so you know when to meet expect me to come to you. So Brody, uh, your your take on sustainability and what we should be doing and what impact and difference we can make. The presentations that have been done today, I think have, uh, have done a great job of highlighting some of the fantastic initiatives uh, that are underway uh, within postal organizations, whether it's uh, uh, greener fleets or alternate out of home delivery methods that make the those distances shorter. You know, as, as, as you look at how the pandemic has transformed the retail landscape, one of the clear differences is that there's a lot more local inventory and a, a lot more usage of the store as a, a node in that e-commerce or omni-channel uh, um, uh, fulfillment capability. And that's where I think Pulse organizations have a remarkable opportunity the, their, their ability to leverage that every house, every day um, offering that they have and be the connector of local business and local inventory to the home or to lockers or to their retail units as a, a pickup drop-off location can have a remarkable impact on the, on the uh, carbon footprint of these organizations because you're moving at shorter distances and you're giving it to giving, making those deliveries the way people want them as uh, Paul Hilder uh, talked about the, you know, using the app to give people insight into where their delivery is and then giving them control of that delivery. All those uh, are initiatives that will take a uh, distance and therefore uh, carbon uh, out of those deliveries. And I, and that will be uh, important investments going forward because as e-commerce has grown, uh, 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 many have talked about it, right? You've got a lot more trucks doing a lot more things and, and there needs to be less of that in a, in a better, more efficient way. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll come to Torhilda next. We, and we often think of Scandinavia as being in the forefront of, of sustainable work. And we saw Anne-Marie Anne Garcio from Postnord. Uh, you mentioned before that it's critical, it's important in Iceland. What, what in particular? I think it's like a 
360 degrees view on this. And now next year we are offering our employees, we're starting at home and we are paying them ex extra paycheck every month to come by either by bike or foot or not by private car to the office or to their location. So that's our first step and, uh, you know, taking it from inside out. And then also the parcel. I think that's a great thing adding to our business is to have parcels that, so people can choose their way to pick up their parcels. They have the information in the app and they can go to the next parcel. Then we have many parcels to or packets to go to one parcel, one location, not to everybody's home. So I think that's one big step. And also, like Anne-Marie said, th that we are transporting a lot of air. I think that's our huge task for the next two, three years is to, you know, uh, our customers need to grow, grow up, you know, stop transporting air with us. So I think we need to look at the 360 degrees from the employees, from our customers, and how can we, you know, maybe not go home to everybody? So I think it's a, like a 360 degrees. I, th I think that was right because she, she said we don't need to transport air, it can move by itself. So uh, yeah, uh, that, was that, brilliant. Makes, that makes renewable energy if it moves by itself. So that's good. But you're right, the, the simple things like that have, may have a massive impact if we can reduce the wastage wasted space the wasted packaging maybe recycling packaging uh, maybe re renew you know sh fewer fewer returns fewer uh, wasted journeys few, fewer miles not just um more more em less emissions etc cetera, etc cetera. there are lots of things that we can we can do thomas uh, in posta slovenia what's your sustain key sustainability initiatives Yes, so I, I, I have strong focus and my uh, professional things is that uh, just now we are checking the possibilities of the roofs uh, of our postal uh, uh, outlets and sorting centers into which we'll, we will be dedicated to collecting the solar energy. So right now we focus 40, 40 roofs and during the daytime we will offer also the citizens that can uh, fill their cars with the electricity and during the night we will fill with uh, those electricity also or, uh, or uh, electric uh, cars and other type of uh, vehicles that we need it for our day-to-day uh, -day operation. So we will put that on our uh, roof and um, and start collecting the the electricity. And uh, what I can say that I am the uh, first Slovenian uh, DC DDG that can that use uh, electric cars uh, company for my for my use. So I am driving uh, with the electric uh, cars, and I would like that also the other employee change uh, our cars uh, from fuel to to electric. And uh, what also we focus with the same problem that we transport almost fifty percent of the air in the packages, and we have the common issues uh, or posters around the, the world, and we have to work together to 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 find out the 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 let's say the results how to how to how to package more smoothly uh, and uh, to 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 deliver just the goods and with less air and so on so i think that we are all in the right way that we have strong uh, ability uh, to support sustainability in the world and to use the, the the green the green power of the future thank you very much thomas and i think your example of your own personal vehicle and to some extent also to hilda talking about her employees coming on foot or by bicycle or whatever we lead by example don't we and as an industry yeah. we can have a big impact by the example and whether it's solar energy or renewables i've also heard that some are uh, talking about projects where all the post offices as well as becoming pudo or pickup points where people can come and just get their parcels in one place 
maybe they can come and recharge their vehicles or get biofuels at the same place. It's a, a renewable, ecological uh, hub, if you like, a hyper-local hub where we can play a role in, in, in the whole agenda. But Jean-Paul, sustainability, and do you see it as a key part of your POC role? And if so, what? Thank you very much. Um, we, we, we could talk hours about this because uh, it, 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 it is really a, a, a huge issue. Um, first, I'd like, say, I'd like to say that I'm a little frustrated um, by the fact that it is not well known that the postal sector has already done a lot. I remember being in 2009 for the COP15 in Copenhagen and um, major players, postal operators, um, committed uh, under the umbrella of IPC to reduce their, their carbon footprint by 20% in I, for the 15 years, I don't remember. And, 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 and they delivered even earlier than um, uh, they were committed to do. And um, for instance, at La Poste, we are carbon uh, neutral since 2012. 2012. So, um, and, and the, the whole group. So, um, um, my, 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 I would like to, 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 to make sure that uh, uh, it is better recognized that the postal sector already, in, uh, at least in some parts of the world, have already uh, showed the way, uh, made really uh, critical things, and, and, and are about also to take more uh, commitment uh, for, for the coming years in front of the, nation, the, the United Nations. And we, we know that the, the EU is um, part of the organization and also within Europe uh, with uh, the, the, the European agenda, of course, uh, we will have to, to, to do more and go to emission free uh, delivery, but it will, of course, uh, take a little more time. Um, just one other thing. Um, you, 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 you might know that during the Congress, three posts, three, posts, three countries uh, put forward a, um, an initiative, a proposal, and it, it, it's unusual that the proposal uh, uh, put on the table at the very last minute is adopted uh, consensually. Um, but we, 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 we it was, it was uh, Germany, uh, Austria, and, and, and France, and now all the members uh, of uh, the um, of the organization said that yes we we, we should do a little, even a little more than what is uh, in the, the the business plan but of course it has to be on um, um, contributions not of the uh, on, not on the budget we we, we, we have to, to to contribute to 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 do more but um, we have our homework to do in every country in every post, but there is something uh, we need the UPU to do is, 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 is to have a global approach and, and um, to make sure that when we send from one country to another, we are able to measure uh, how much carbon it, it uses and, and, and if it is compensated, fine. If it's not compensated, to compensate it, because our customers want to know and they want to be carbon free and they want to be emission free in, in the coming years. So um, without the UPU, I think we will not succeed. Um, so we, 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 we really have to work hard on this uh, during this cycle. So we need to do more and we need to be transparent and need to be visible about what we do. Uh, absolutely. Mike, uh, sustainability, I mean, I mean, obviously financial inclusion is part of Sivo talked about financial inclusion, but what else is MasterCard's uh, sustainability uh, agenda? Well, I would just say two things, building on what, on what Jean-Paul said uh, a moment ago. Um, one is I think we can do a lot from the private sector to help people understand what their carbon footprint is, including the footprint associated with shipping goods around the world and to take action accordingly. We came out with a, a carbon calculator later working with a, a company in Sweden called Economy, which measures your carbon footprint as you spend on your card and then allows you to immediately offset it, not with carbon credits, but by planting trees, nature-based solutions. 
And increasingly, that will become a more and more sophisticated effort where we can take into account whether you're buying locally or you're buying globally and what carbon footprint is associated with, uh, with, with the, the, the transportation of that product uh, to market. The other thing I would say is just from the private sector perspective, MasterCard, every other major company right now is wrestling with the issue of net zero and how to achieve net zero. And a big part from our perspective, a big part of our, our footprint is not things that we control, but it's, under, it's our supply chain, it's our partners, including I imagine for many companies, their shipping and the logistics and getting their product delivered to market. So this is a wonderful opportunity for the postal system, as, as you all have been discussing, to think about how to reinvent itself on a sustainable basis, whether it's where you deliver or how you deal with the issue of air or any of the, a number of the other issues that are sort of built into this explosion of e-commerce and deliveries of, of parcels associated uh, with that, because every company is going to need to incorporate that into their plans. And again, another great area for public-private partnership where I imagine many of your biggest private sector shippers will have a keen interest in working with you to figure out how to reinvent delivery and logistics on a more sustainable basis. Thank you for that. And I, I, I think the, you have a unique possibility there as MasterCard to help, I mean, along with the other payment systems, to help us understand the impact of our purchases. I think not all of us always understand really the ecological impact of what we're purchasing and down the line. And that, that could be really, really transformative. But also this decarbonizing of supply chains, not just the, the ones you're directly responsible for, but the ones that are implied cascading out, if you like, uh, through the logistic system, which we're all familiar with how it works, but that that can have a, a real value to uh, have a, the, the sort of multiplier effect in terms of impact. So that's great. Thanks for that round on, on sustainability. I, one more topic I want to cover before we have to wrap up actually really, which is the future business direction drivers of the, of the business. We talked about us in the sustainability, about a sustainability business model, a sustainable business model. Well, what is going to make it sustainable? Where is our business going to come from? Are we going to rely entirely on e-commerce packaging or letters going to decline inevitably? Uh, Brody, you've been studying this for many years now and coming out with reports about the future of posts. Where, where is, where, what's the principal trends and drivers of future business? Well, the obvious is e-commerce. Uh, we do a, re a piece of research every year uh, called the future of posts. And this year, when we asked where growth opportunities lie, 77% of the respondents uh, listed e-commerce. Uh, uh, financial services was the next, uh, and it was about 22% that uh, placed emphasis there. So that gives you a sense of the, of the, uh, the preeminence of that uh, opportunity and the importance of getting that right. There will be significant growth in that space uh, for the next several years and post organizations are well placed to take advantage of the trends as uh, inventory uh, gets uh, faster and more local uh, as uh, retailers look at partners that have reach and access uh, and can connect the physical with the digital post can do that better than anyone else. So that's certainly the, the biggest area. As I look at where other opportunities lie, as brick and mortar retrenches a little bit, and we see that happening not just in the retail sector, uh, but also in uh, in banking and, and some of these other areas, I think posts have a remarkable opportunity to be that physical presence for uh, other organizations and connect the physical and digital in ways that it just it doesn't make sense for others. And as Jean-Paul has, has talked about, I think the UPU can play a significant role in that, especially as you look at that global connection that posts and only posts really uh, can, can enable. So e-commerce, um, financial services, the physical presence, and then a global physical presence, I think are kind of the four big areas that I see for opportunity. Thank you, Brody. To Hilda, when you're looking at your five-year strategic plan, what's in the vision for that? 
we are, the letters are declining, as you know, and uh, we are thinking that maybe in five years' time we are going to have one-on-one packets and, and letters, so it's declining rapidly and increasing the, the packages. And we are working with Western Union in, in the banking system. You know, we are transferring money for people who live in Iceland. And I think that's part of what we are going to do ahead. Um, so I think it's mostly the packages. They are just going up and we need to invest in the parcels and, and continue on that. Your parcel, parcel lockers and your parcel, your yeah. parcel sortation and uh, apps and keeping close to your customers. Who knows what they're going to want next next week, next year. You can listen to them and find out, right? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Thomas, the future, where where do you see the future business? You're, you're, you said earlier on you're the youngest guy on the, I don't know if that's true, but you might be. Uh, well, you've got the future ahead of you. Where, where, what's it going to involve? Yeah, uh, so as the first point, as uh, you already mentioned, is the e-commerce. And the second point that I uh, uh, try to figure out is uh, how the postman, how the post office uh, will look like in 2050. And we were thinking with our uh, strategy department, how it looks like we, we should drone it, you know, uh, with whom we will deliver something, what we will deliver. And we find out the one expect, uh, aspect uh, means uh, social service. Mm -hmm. So we as a post, as a postman, we were each day on each address in Slovenia. And for example, uh, because we don't know what we will do in 2050, we try to uh, different things. And one of that is uh, early recognition of dementia by the old people. So as uh, President Kennedy said, don't ask a state uh, to give you something, but you give to the state something. And we as a post of Slovenia, we, we try to give a state the also uh, perspective of view of social services. We don't know if we will um, uh, in real uh, do it for the for the government of for the state, but uh, we are now uh, trying different things, and this is one of the latest things that we uh, already educate um, our postmen that they are uh, when deliver the post try to recognize the early steps of dementia because for example i see my grandmother once in a two months but the postman see it uh, almost every day you know and this can be one of the aspect of the future of the post i'm not saying that will be but it can be and uh, it's uh, regarding to as Jean Paul and uh, Brody and you all the speakers uh, said uh, among the UPU it can be globalized and it can have the aspect on the whole population in the world. Uh, so as I for the conclusion to repeat myself, we as a post are each day on each address globally. And we have to go out of that and see what the possibility and chances are. Thank you very much for that. And it's a unique position we hold and a unique responsibility. And I, I must admit, I hadn't thought of diagnosing dementia as being one of the future business areas, but why not? And it, it's part of our social dimension, the social care role that we've always talked about. And Jean-Paul, Corporate social responsibility has been a big factor for La Poste in the past and continues to be, I'm sure. But broader than that, what are your your future insights into the business? What we're going to be preoccupied with? Where we're going? Well, I, I will not repeat what Brody said very clearly, and I fully agree with him. Um, um, two things I would like to add. Um, there was one word which has been already pronounced, but which is in the middle of it, it's proximity. Uh, and in uh, a digital world, uh, proximity means something. But we, we do not know exactly, uh, precisely what, but we, we have a strong feeling that it does mean something. And here again, there, 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 there are two models of post. Um, uh, the the, the post um, who still have a heavy, 
network, physical network of post offices, and 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 the one who have totally partnered it, and and we there there are some some posts uh, not having any more uh, a, a a network. But if you have your own network, for sure it cannot leave only with parcels and and mail. So you 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 have to have other activities. Some uh, have a bank. Some offer uh, it to the banking sector. The financial activities um, are um, the, the, the most obvious part, probably the most obvious uh, goal. And, and um, also because the, the, the retail banking is suffering at the moment, at least in Europe, but I'm sure that in, in many other places, and they are closing many uh, retail points. So um, there, there is here a clear opportunity. There is an, another, I don't know if we, I know we are not alone at La Poste to, to, to work on this, but uh, in our um, strategic plan, we, and, and for the second one, we, we are um, uh, working on health. Um, um, how can we help uh, the, the, the state to keep people at home as long as possible uh, in an aging population? And uh, we, we, we feel that there is something also we, we, we can do uh, to, to, to do this. Thank you for that, John Paul, and widening it out. And in a way, there can be a, 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 a huge remit that we, we can adopt as, as a postal network. And from the proximity point, which used to be the physical proximity, it still is in many cases, the post office is the biggest network, can do all, all manner of services people come to that post office we can provide all sorts of services but equally now we're on digital platforms we can provide sort of amalgamate services on digital platforms for all kinds of people all kinds of services make things possible uh, sort of facilitate trade as we've been talking about facilitate small businesses facilitate all other kinds of interactions and as Brody mentioned earlier on in his example digital is very the, the ultimate proximity, the other, ultimate immediacy. And if we can be in on that, we can be enabling a lot of it to happen as an, in, as, as an enabler, which is of, like several people in the, this morning talked about connecting everybody, which is, which is what we do. Mike, uh, last time coming to you uh, on the crystal ball gla gazing, where, where, do you, where do you see our industry looking out, looking in from outside? Well, I'm in, I'm in full agreement with everything that's, that's been said. I think you really put your finger on it, which is on one hand, post offices quickly upgrading to be digital players and being able to provide from a digital platform perspective, a wide range of services to their customers. And on the other hand, taking advantage of the fact that, that they have this physical proximity and this physical network that may become even more valuable, as Jean-Paul said, others pull back. And so how can the postal systems use their physical presences to offer more services, whether it's banking or health or any number of other services, as others sort of pull back their physical presence and really thinking in a blue sky way about what the value of that proximity is, I think would be very valuable for postal unions as a whole. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And I'm conscious that we've more or less run out of time. So. Can I just take the opportunity to thank all five of you for your really interesting and insightful contributions and sharing your experience. So thank you, Brody, Torhilda, Thomas, Jean-Paul and Mike. And uh, thank you for your contribution to our discussion this afternoon. And uh, I'm sure our audience have found it interesting as well. So uh, I hope to meet you in due course. And I'll, I'll allow you to leave the, the panel room, if you like, while I just make a few final summing up remarks of the of from the world leaders forum so thanks once again thank you thank you so much bye bye so as we come to con conclude the uh, day the upu world leaders forum uh, let me make a few final remarks um, it's been a very interesting stimulating day i hope you've enjoyed hearing the insights starting this morning with the opening remarks from pascal cleaver uh, reflecting on the last two cycles and talking about where we we're going and we started that way and then went into hearing from five different parts of the world what their postal leaders 
experiences were, what they'd learned from the pandemic, how they were refocusing their in, their businesses and the many things they were doing. We had some common themes, but we also heard some unique things that were happening in different places. So very interesting uh, this morning. And then we had a, a detailed discussion with Pasca, with Siva and with David and with the input from Anne-Marie on sustainability and such an important topic, such a wide ranging topic. And of course, now we've had the the rich experience of hearing from five industry experts with different perspectives. So that's rounded off the day. So let me just tell you about a couple of other things. We're in Vienna at the moment for the World Parcel and Post Expo. And I, if you happen to be in Vienna, that's great. You can join the conference. And if I tell you that as well as tomorrow, the opening, there's more lessons from the pandemic. There's more of these themes coming on. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll have a COP26 session. We'll also have a session about digital transformation and then exploring the digital landscape. Um, on Thursday, we'll also have a session on e-commerce. And you'll be able to also go along to the UPU stand if you're here and see about the latest postal technology updates that are going to be given by David Asek from the UPU who's going to talk about CDS and DPS, big data and innovation and partnerships. So the latest technology that's being developed from UPU uh, will be given out in short presentations from the UPU stand. And if you're not able to be in Vienna, don't worry because you can go onto the Parcel and Post Expo website and you can follow most of the conference sessions, which are going to be live broadcast, I understand. And if you miss all of that, or if indeed you miss some of today, you can come afterwards and downstream uh, and stream down, download rather, stream these uh, events afterwards and follow them afterwards. So hopefully nobody misses out on anything. Uh, so just to wrap up then, I'd just like to make some final thanks to people who've made this World Leaders Forum possible. And in particular, the speakers who recorded their presentations for this morning, I thought they were fabulous and thank you for the people who helped them with their recordings and of course the panelists who appeared in person uh, which were really uh, in, in, informative and instructive just now uh, thank you to all of you around the world i know we had hundreds of people uh, who were registered and peer, uh, joining us from time to time and probably still more will be looking at the presentations later on and uh, streaming what we've talked about so thank you for your questions and comments we haven't been able to follow up all the questions and comments unfortunately but uh, it's quite hard in this format to to do that i hope that in future events we'll be able to meet in person uh, maybe this time next year uh, the past and post expo will be in frankfurt i understand so maybe we'll be able to have an in-person event there where we'll all be able to meet face to face and have lots of side conversations and detailed discussions as well um, so thank you for everybody participating for your attention. And then, of course, um, I'd like to thank the uh, communications team, uh, communication and events team from UPU, who uh, have enabled this to happen. Um, David Dadge, Giselle Caron, and that's, nothing of this would be possible at all without Katerina Sitnikova, who's sitting next to me, who's been helping me all the way make it happen. So thank you to all three of you. And of course, to Helio and Olivia, the technical people who've been on the platform. And uh, I think that's thanking most people who've been directly involved. Um, but suffice to say, the only thing remains to say is thank you again. And we'll see you again, hopefully in person soon. If you're around in Vienna, say hello. And thank you for attention today and if i can remember that you're all on a different time zone say good morning good day good afternoon good night and see you next time thank you very much